Hey, John, good to meet you. Thanks for coming on today. What's up, man? Good to meet you as well. Awesome, man. No, I'm really excited to talk to you today. Um, so you're the CEO of Songfinch. That's so a platform for custom songwriting. And as a musician myself, um, I was really impressed with what you do. And obviously, you have a pretty phenomenal growth story as well. Uh, so we got a lot to talk about. But um, why don't you tell me a little bit about your journey? A little bit about my journey. Where do you want me to start? How far? Uh, so uh, you're, how about your love of music? Yeah, I mean, I've been building and operating companies in the music and technology space for 24 years now. Um, so goes back, let's call it late 90s, uh, from DJing house parties in high school to self-taught recording engineer. After that, I worked in a bunch of uh, studios in, in Chicago. Um, and then I ran a relatively successful indie hip hop label in Chicago, late 90s, early 2000s, and then kind of took off from there and explored basically every facet and avenue within the the music business itself for the last 20 plus years. That's phenomenal. So how did you marry that with tech? How'd I marry it with tech? So let's call it, <coughs> excuse me, let's call it 2005. Um, I was managing a handful of artists at the time. Um, and I, I, I was looking at the future of music and basically my bet was the future of music was artists and brand partnerships. Mm -hmm. Brands, I believed at that time were going to come in and uh, supplement a lot of the, the marketing dollars that, that labels were previously spending. Mm -hmm. um, I think that idea, like a lot of my ideas, was notoriously early, um, <laughs> but typical of visionaries for sure. Yeah, I mean, but basically around that time decided, hey, instead of managing seven artists and prepping these seven artists for like brand partnerships and sync and everything else that I thought was going to be like hot um, in the near future around that time, I was like, why don't why don't I create a, a two sided marketplace to connect all of the artists to, to all of the opportunities? Mm. So it was around that time when started kind of laying out the blueprints for uh, one of my earlier startups called Music Dealers. Um, we ended up officially launching, I believe, like 2007. And the idea was repping indie artists um, for to utilize their music in sync. So movies, TV shows, video games, commercials, et cetera. Yeah. Um, ended up building that platform to rep about 30,000 artists from 200 countries. Oh my God. Um, on the supply side, on the client side, we did music for everyone from Microsoft to Airbnb to Coca-Cola who I eventually ended up selling a majority stake in the company to in 2011. Wow. That's amazing. You know, I'm, so I, I mentioned I'm a musician myself and music was always my, my first love. I was uh, back in the eighties watching Metallica and Ozzy Osbourne and stuff on MTV. I think I was like a little, probably four or five years old, jamming out on a tennis racket, right? All the way to Ozzy. You were watching Ozzy Osbourne at five years old, like, bite the heads off of bats. Like that was like the notorious. That's, that's how I got my start. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Before Amazing. even headbangers ball and all that. And so when I was uh, probably like eight or nine, I was obsessed. I wanted to play guitar. Dad, I want to play guitar. I want to play guitar. And um, got my first guitar. And I just sat there with the tapes, the Metallica tapes, just rewinding, playing them, just hacking it all out by ear. And I was really happy when we got our first CD player. But um, I mean, I spent so much time at the at the you know at the CD store, or the record store, just listening to everything that came out. And um, I was in a heavy metal band, hardcore band, and all that. in, in the in the early mid '90s, um, did a little bit of touring, kind of up in like the tri-state area and New York and stuff. And um, really, just wanted it to be my life. So actually, I went to uh, a music academy, and because my guitar teacher was like, you know, if you if you want to play like Kirk Hammett. And you don't want to just repeat his songs. You need to be classically trained, right? Because he's Ooh. classically trained and Slash is classically trained and all these guys. So, so that was it. That was my life. And then as soon as I got the first taste of the music business, it was a totally different story. 
yeah, it was the, such a sleazy the, the music industry system. will absolutely wreck and whoop your ass to be honest it, did. Um, it whipped me real fast like within the first few years i think you know we i i was in spent some time in some recording studios kind of toying with recording songs maybe leading up to an album and i mean it was it was just a mess between the drugs and all the sleaze balls trying to suck all the life out of you the venues and even the you know the, the bar owners and stuff that would that wouldn't pay you um it, even had a, a bandmate who was on drugs steal my guitar which was actually a guitar that was owned by jeff hanneman the lead guitarist from slayer um crazy. i had pictures on my wall like cut out of magazines of the guitar from slayer holding my guitar and it got stolen and pawned for drug money so i actually I bailed out of that life um, and tech was my other love and, and computers. And that became my, my journey. Then like you in college, I started DJing. Uh, I was a drum and bass DJ at the time. So, you know, in Miami, we had this big thing called the winter music conference. It was this incredible thing that happened once a year. Yeah. Um, and I got to I be was, on the inside. I was of that. at winter music conference several times. For Is sure. that right? Maybe but we crossed paths at some point, yeah. <laughs> but then the same thing. So, you know, you start get as soon as we graduated from the house parties and, and the warehouse parties and started playing at venues and, and trying to book gigs, there came the music business again and just really took all the fun out of it. Um, and so, you know, it was always a, a hobby and kind of a little side hustle for me. But um, uh, but again, tech was that tried and true kind of business. And it was always I always felt like it should be better. So fast forward, maybe decade or so and uh i had a, a, a good friend of mine from grad school who was also a dj and started this this music platform um kind of for like the health and fitness industry so creating dj mixes for fitness studios and and different athletic kind of contexts um and so went and joined that company as cto and we had a great time like building this platform building the tech but then also working with all the djs and trying to bring you know, bring people up and, and bring up a lot of the DJs out of here in SoCal and in, in LA and San Diego. Um, that was a lot of fun. And then guess what happened? Now the music licensing business comes around. All the lawyers start putting the target on our back and, and just, again, took all the fun out of it. Long story short, I'm, I'm just really happy that you have been able to build a platform to support artists. So I just want to say I'm a, I'm a fan. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, the, the driving force of any and all of these businesses that I've created. I think when you look at the music industry, there's such a, a wide gap between the the 1% that tends to eat, let's call it 85% of all of the dollars. So yeah, I mean, the term star starving artist is, is 100% real. I mean, it's, it's the reality for 99% of uh, musicians that aren't the the superstar class mm -hmm. um and traditionally there's never been this middle class of musician and i believe what we're doing currently with song finch is definitely forging this new path of like building a marketplace model from the bottom up in which as a business we've created this demand for this uh highly emotive experience rather than who is creating it and because of that, it's now allowed us to just focus on talent. Like, I don't need the artist on the platform to drive the demand from the artist side. Yeah. Uh, I mean, drive the demand from the customer side. So we're able to just focus on like really talented individuals. I don't care how many followers they have on social. I don't care about career accomplishments. It's about people who can create really great music. And those people, um, will thrive on our platform. Yeah. And then it's an entirely new revenue stream too, right? So whether it's, you know, so you don't have to go out and gig at weddings or even try to get people to promote and come to your shows, but here's another opportunity, another path for, for especially for songwriters, right? Who have it equally, if not more difficult than, uh, you know, than the performing artists um, to make a living, right? And if there's more opportunities to make a living, it means more people are going to do it and we're going to have more music and art in our world. So it's all good. Yeah, that's the thing. The thing about kind of forging or creating a new business vertical within the music space, like yeah. personalized music prior to us was a, 
it, it was a tough path to uh, yeah. to educate a consumer base on. Um, oh, it, it, I mean, it blew me away right away. So, you know, again, as a musician, I'm actually not really a songwriter. Um, I'm kind of like this pattern matching machine where I can hear any song or see any sheet of music. And in a few attempts, I can play it sort of perfectly. Um, but there's some sort of creative piece that's always been missing for me. Uh, maybe it's just, I don't know, doubt or, or perfectionism, but I love the concept. And I mean, to be honest, I'll probably be a, a customer here soon. But so you can, you, I can hire an independent artist to create a song for me for any occasion. But what, what does that experience actually look like? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, like, let's talk about like what, what somebody's coming here for. I think at the beginning, when we created this, let's call it several years, like we had this understanding that we were selling personalized music and we were trying to educate a new user base on why you would want personalized music. And then even more so why you would want a personalized song from an artist that you've never heard of before. And as you can imagine, there was a struggle there, a struggle mm -hmm. to kind of like connect those dots. And then I think like for us, the epiphany moment was, hey, we're not really selling personalized music. We're selling this unbelievably highly emotive experience to a user. Mm -hmm. And music just happens to be like the most formidable vehicle to deliver that experience. So once we started kind of a uh, perspective shift and started looking at it as like this emotive experience that we're selling and the musicians are the ones that happen to deliver it, like, everything kind of changed for us in regards to just how we were communicating that, how an audience like understood it. Um, and then like how we, we ended up like eventually delivering it. So from a process standpoint, it's super simple. I mean, you come here and uh, let's say you want to get something for your significant other to make them cry happy tears as an anniversary gift. Um, you go through a bunch of inputs. Um, you're able to select genre, gender, vocalist, moods, tempo, thing, things of that sort. Um, you know, inputs that make you feel like a co-creator in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this whole storytelling process where there's a bunch of text prompts and things like that. Um, that in the scenario I'm talking about, you would probably talk about how you and this other individual met, some cool inside stories and jokes along the way, you know, just um, things to, to, in this case, like really pull at the heartstrings. Yeah. And then all of that information is kind of packaged together and put into a brief and um, it's shared with the right artist from our community. I think we're over, I think we're at about 2,200 active artists right now. Um, and they take that information and they bring something to life, uh, kind of creating from scratch. And, you know, 10 times out of 10, the user is completely blown away. And then they're giving it as a gift to, uh, to somebody. And that person's completely surprised and blown away. And they usually go through the same process of like the song plays. There's some like uncanny, like, coincidences in the song and it's like perking their attention and then they like have this realization moment that holy shit this is about me or us wow. and then it usually turns to like full-blown emotional um and like no matter how many thousands of times i've got a chance to watch that like it, it never gets old and like you know i mean to me what we've created here is like this it may sound a little corny but it's like this uh flywheel of good karma mm -hmm. like that we're operating at scale i mean we're creating let's call it a thousand of these songs a day right now wow um and yeah like you're you're bringing these stories to life you're connecting people in a whole new way and you're allowing a, an artist community to make significant dollars um and get paid immediately like we all know that like that's Getting paid immediately in the music industry does not go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Everything about music is hurry up and wait. We've created a system in which you could work on a song today and have money to go out on the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, there's just, you know, so it, so it, it feels good. It feels like we're, you know, we're, we're building up this strong base 
um, outside of like just dollars and cents to the artist community and being able to create consistently at a, at a high volume, um, we're also like creating this environment in which they're building up these like evangelist uh, level of fans, like one mm -hmm. at a time. Like you can imagine, like you create a memorial song for somebody that's lost somebody, like how special you become in their life. Like mm -hmm. once they're touched by that, that piece of art. Mm. That's incredible. I love it. And, and so something that you said really stuck with me around actually making it a joyful experience. So it's not just about the product itself. It's actually the experience of creating the song, co-creating the song that is equally, if not more valuable than the song itself. No, like, I, I think that's what this whole thing is built on. Um, you know, I, I, I think on the surface, it's a platform where we're creating and bringing people's like most intimate memories and stories to life. Um, I think, uh, as you dive in and as you start to see where this is going or what it can become, I think mm -hmm. it's all rooted around this belief that passive consumerism is mm -hmm. like yesterday mm -hmm. and active being a participant or a co-creator in art that I engage with is the future. So I think... I think when you, when you start to look at what we're really doing, it, that, that's what it's about. It's about um, breaking down the walls, removing any and all barrier to entry to who is a participant, blurring the line between who is an actual creator and who's a consumer. Mm. And like the future of where we can take some of those things as we're kind of uh, teaching both sides of this marketplace how to interact with one another, I think is, is where things really start to get exciting. No, I love that. So moving obviously beyond the, the, the blind consumerism and the last phase was all about personalization, right? Where I plug in some numbers and then you give me something that's tailored to me, but I'm still a consumer. Now I'm an active co-creator in that process, which means I have more ownership of it. I love that. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think, I think when you just like look at, uh, con consumer behavior, like not even just in music, but across like a bunch of different, uh, kind of business verticals, mm -hmm. you see that like, uh, it, it began like this, this evolution of expectation as a consumer to me, it like began with speed and that's where mm -hmm. Amazon won out. Amazon created this environment in which if you can't get something at 6 p.m. today and it's noon now, like I'm, 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 I'm disappointed. Like they've created that expectation as a consumer from a speed standpoint. And now I believe that we're definitely neck deep in this like personalization piece or what I like to talk about. What we're doing is like hyper personalization, mm -hmm. you know, not personalization like my name on a coffee mug, but personalization mm -hmm. like this art is reflecting who I am. Yeah. Um, and then I think like the next step to that, and again, I'm, I'm self-admittedly really tend to be really early to spaces, but I think the next piece is, is again, this idea of, of co-creation, not just having something that feels like mine, but I actually helped, uh, yeah. create, um, my, my, my fingerprint is all over it. It's not just, uh, something that somebody else created for me. Yeah, uh, that's incredible. I mean, again, and it's all about ownership, right? So I'm going to value that thing, not to say regardless of the quality, but independent of the quality of the output, right? I'm going to value that thing more because it's mine. I mean, oh, it's like my little, ink. my little craft project, my little pot that I made at the art class. I'm going to put up on a shelf, but I certainly wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't pride buy that. Of, up. Pride of authorship is an unbelievably like strong thing, Powerful right? Thing. Wow. Yeah, I love it. There's another aspect to this too that I, I really like is because um, I'm, I'm a product guy, right? I'm a tech guy, I work with tons of SaaS companies as an executive coach um, and a consultant and everything over the years. And so I'm really, really, really deep into product development. And what you're making me think about and realize is, you know, we're all so focused on the outcome. 
it is all about what is the use case, what is the goal state, what is the task we are trying to complete through this product. And I'm always an evangelist around customer experience, right? So I always talk about like this, you know, yes, the goal is very important. Absolutely. That is the primary thing is you're driving them towards a goal state that makes their lives better. But the experience has to be really good as well in order to get them there, you know, in, in a seamless way. And so I'm really, I'm, another big love of mine is video games. And so when the whole gamification trend came about, uh, I was really kind of pissed off with how everyone got it wrong when it's all about trophies and addictive cycles and, you know, trying to drive engagement. That's not gamification. Games are about fun. Games are about enjoying the process. So if I'm, if I'm picking, if I'm mining in Minecraft or in Stardew Valley, like I'm actually having fun. It's not so much about what I'm doing, but about the enjoyable process. Uh, and so that's something that I've been trying to do, trying to evangelize as well is, hey, there's, let's take gamification in a different way. How do we actually make this experience fun and enjoyable? Even if you're doing something that's maybe mundane or, or boring and, and especially in a, a B2B space or anything that you're doing with relation to work, how do we not only make this thing easier and more effective, but also make it fun? Um, and so I really, really love what you're what you're doing here and how you're making that uh, obviously that experience more joyful for people. Yeah, and being a product person like yourself, I mean, you can imagine like product iteration, like what the the consumer, what the public has access to, is always like three or four iterations behind, like where you're designing and developing. So. Yeah. I'm very excited that um, consumers enjoy our current experience because like mm -hmm. where we're taking it to in the future, like is, is going to be next level. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of gamification components on the artist side of things. And like you said, it, it, it's to me, there's fun in the journey. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think like a lot of the engagement loop stuff that you're talking about, it's definitely created in a sense where it does focus on like trophies and output. Mm -hmm. But I think like the, the experiences that are crafted like perfectly, like mm -hmm. there's fun in that journey as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's what it's about for us. Like just like super high level and like bringing what I'm talking about into context a little bit is like right now, like, if you go on song finch and you begin to create a song it's like part of the you is the 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 purchaser and potentially the gifter um like you reminiscing and telling those stories like to me that is like part of what you're paying for mm -hmm. but the way that it's currently set up it's like part of the checkout flow right now right so i think from a user standpoint it isn't necessarily being uh, celebrated as much as it is, as it, as it can be. Yeah. So like thinking forward, like making the purchase in front of that. So then you're like, cool, I just paid for this song. And the first part of the experience is like me putting on my creative cap and like going back in time and revisiting these times and like, coming up with these stories and sharing all these ideas. Like to me, that's part of what you're getting out of this. It isn't just the song that's three minutes and it's delivered seven days later. Like yeah. it's this entire experience for the, the, the purchaser as well. That is like, uh, I think it's undervalued right now because it's like part of a checkout process. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I was, I was actually a little surprised you say that that so much of it is sort of filled out into form as opposed to being whether it's recorded on video or, or done live. Uh, there probably is a lot of opportunity there I'm sure you're working on to guide that experience in a more rich way. You know, you can only do so many things when it's part of a checkout process. Yeah. Like every other thing that we add to that experience makes it, uh, makes it longer, makes mm -hmm. it more... Uh, involved to the point of like where you continue to see more fall off instead of getting all right, the way through right. the funnel because it feels like work but in the future yeah. this this idea that you know that that process can feel significantly more collaborative rather than form fill out mm 
-hmm. Like maybe the artist that you're selecting is interacting with you via video clips and they're basically Mm -hmm. telling you why these sections are important for you to fill out and how to best share the information so they can bring these things to life. You know, like beginning to create this connection with the artist rather than feeling like your relationship is with an e-com brand, you know? Like there's such a human experience to all of it. There's genre and style and and instrument and all that, but every songwriter has their own creative process as well. So I imagine each one of them has their own sort of story and how they're bringing you through their own creative process. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. Um, So now I want to talk about growth because you have a pretty incredible growth journey as well. And, you know, product market fit is, uh, is really where I sit in, in the market as a, as a coach. I've been working with startup founders for about 20 years now from the earliest idea stage all the way up through, you know, big enterprise. And the place where I have the most fun is at that inflection point of, of product market fit. And the, and the way I kind of describe it is it's when... Well, it's when things become less difficult, right? You've been pushing things up. You've been pushing the boulder up the hill for so long. Every bit of growth is is a game of inches. And then the, you reach this certain point where you kind of crest the hill and it starts to move under its own momentum. Um, or like you're, you've crossed the event horizon of a black hole, right? Where gravity starts to take over and you don't know exactly when you've reached that moment, but It's where things essentially become effortless uh, and and weightless. But I also call it the eye of the hurricane because you have all this chaos in the early startup stage and that product market fit is the moment where things start to click. And again, it becomes effortless. You feel like you're floating. But then as you move into the scale stage, there's a whole new environment of chaos that, that awaits you. You were going along the way most founders do and you hit a a, a period of 27,000 percent growth is that right yeah we're three year right now three years 27,000 percent so you might not have even had it sounds funny even saying it out loud to be honest (laughs) it's like what yeah but but you you didn't you may not have even had that moment to kind of to hum along um you might have gotten sort of whiplash as you as you grew into that i mean let 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 me let me tell you let me kind of give you this build up and I think it'll put things into to more pers- more perspective and I think it'll be even more odd when I just like talk about the path. For sure. So conceptually this company started in 2016 like many years ago and you know it started I I created a song for my brothers. Uh, I was the best man at his wedding and created a song because I gave shitty speeches and didn't want (laughs) to put together this crazy best man speech. So I gave like a 30 second speech. Oh, it's pouring here. So I gave like a 30 second speech, told the DJ to hit play. And you know, you get to watch a room full of 200 kind of run the gamut of emotions from laughs to tears and like, from there, it wasn't like, oh, cool, we have the next big unicorn business. Like, it wasn't like that. It was like, hey, there's something here. Like, I love the, the consu- like potential consumer reaction to this. Mm-hmm. And like, having built uh, marketplace models in the past, especially within the music space, it was like, let, let's test this out. Let's see if there's something here. One, let's see if we can get an accessible enough price point to have good artists come onto the platform and be able to create. Let's see if we can create margins that could actually make sense to scale this into the level of businesses that, that um, we, we, we look to be able to build. Um, so it was 2016, 17, 18, 19, where- The overnight you know, success, three years dude, in the making. I mean, right? <laughs> like we raised, let's call it, we raised during that time half a million bucks from friends and family and put in some of our own money. We hired a couple people here to work on this, to work on that. But it was, it was basically like a couple of us, like heads down while we were running other businesses, like trying to find something that worked. And the, the, the peak of those early years of, 16, 17, 18, 19, the peak of the first four years, which was this extreme grind, was $140,000 in revenue in 2019. 
Mm. And it was basically like, hey, I had a, a, another business, a, a creative agency that was doing really well at that time. My brother, who was basically full t- the only person full time on this business, who's one of our co-founders, he was he was incredibly bored trying to run it by himself. And we were basically like we have 30 at the end of 2019, we had thirty thousand dollars left. And we're basically like, we've tried everything like the consumer response from the several hundred songs or whatever we've done or the couple thousand or whatever we did after those first four years. Like the response was incredible. It was exactly what we wanted. We just didn't know how to sell it. Like Mm. no one wanted personalized music to us. And January 2020, we were going to close things down. And it was basically like we have $30,000 left. Let's give it one extra oomph. Valentine's Day is right around the corner in a month or six weeks. Let's 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 put these this last 30 grand, let's put it to work. Most likely it's going to end just as the other 470,000 or whatever before that <laughs> ended. Um so that's that point in which really diving in, unplugging, taking off the music hat. I think that was like unbelievably important i think like being music people for so long we were so caught up that we were selling music mm. and i think like you know a, a, a simon Sinek ted, ted talk that everyone else has seen and like a handful of different things like combined to have this epiphany for us to say like fuck we are selling like this experience yeah. like what's the best way to sell this experience like all of our previous ad content and everything that we were doing was like, you share your stories and then a musician takes it and creates this song and you get it back and you love it. And like that, that narrative took way too long to, to, to kind of pitch. Hmm. So what we did, we didn't really have any like reveal video content at that time. Like we had never really collected it before. And we're like, shit, if we can show like somebody having this emotive experience, like, The audience can look at that, see themselves within it and be like, I want to have an experience like that with somebody else. And maybe that'll be the trigger point for them to make a purchase. So because we didn't have any of that content and we didn't have time to really shoot that content, I went on YouTube and stole a bunch of content to people crying. (laughs) I, I ripped videos of other people's YouTube videos of them crying around an experience we basically built like this like 30 second mashup mm-hmm. one piece of content spot and put it on facebook and ran like 30 grand behind it we did almost two hundred thousand dollars that week wow so it was like holy shit it was the best and the worst week of life we didn't have a staff to fulfill any of these orders i mean we had an artist community that was ready to go but like as you can imagine, we're getting inundated with con- customer service tickets and everything. It was like 23 hour around the clock. Rob, uh, who's our other co-founder who was working on it full time, like he was miserable for that week. And I was like, it's working. It's doing exactly what we wanted it to do. And he was like, turn off the ads. Like, I can't mess with this anymore. <laughs> like, turn it off. I don't care how well it's doing. So um, like that was that moment where it was like, oh shit, we're actually not going to close it. Mm -hmm. I need to stop working on everything that I'm working on and I need to go head down. Like we can actually make this work. Like that was the pivot point. So then from there, we did a million and a half in 2020. Did five and a half million last year. We're going to do 40 million this year. And there's a really clear path to a hundred million next year. So like, that's where we're talking about, you know, the 140 grand to a $40 million year in a three year run. There's this 27,000% explosive growth. And it's like, you know, like you said, I don't know if like, I don't know if it was really like this traditional, like, Hey, we found product market fit. Finally, I think we just figured out how to sell it. Hmm. Like the product wasn't that much different than it was in 2016 when no one wanted it. Yeah. Well, so again, as a, you know, as a product guy, I'm not a marketing expert at all. And so I lean into product marketing. And so I marry Mark, that's basically the marriage of marketing and and uh, customer experience. And there's only one rule I know about product marketing. 
Don't sell features, sell benefits. Even better, don't sell benefits, sell a better version of themselves, right? Sell them their own future, something that they can see themselves in. And that sounds like what you did right there. You started with, you were selling a product, a song, even if you tried to say making it fun, whatever, but then you pitched it and said, this is you at your wedding, at a birthday, at an anniversary. This is you crying these tears of joy after going through this experience. And that's the thing that really clicked with people. Uh, it's amazing how powerful an example that was. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm probably gonna refer back to this forever. I, I will tell you this because I'm always trying to explain this to people in like intellectual terms, but there is probably no better example of that. So actually I'd love to, to even uh, get the link to that original video, that viral video. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Believe me, I got hit up multiple times during that week of saying like, hey, that's me. Like, yeah, this is my shit. Why are you using it? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love now, to uh, like, even see the before and after, you know? Yeah. And now like, uh, you know, we get hundreds of these real consumer live, yes. uh, live reveals. Like we're getting hundreds of these videos every single month. Wow. And like, that's what propels all of our digital marketing. Wow. You know, we have so many of things. these like unbelievable stories of like, you know, that, that, that traditional story arc of like the surprise, the delight, the, oh my God, this is me to like full blown emotion. And like, yeah, you know, the, those videos themselves have, have kind of become like this gamification component in which consumers who see that and that's their trigger to make a purchase are naturally trying to capture the same thing themselves and one up the one that like made them buy. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's become a really cool thing where the customers themselves are like our biggest. Uh... Yeah. So that's interesting, right? So, cause you're not, you're not selling the song, you're selling the tears of joy. That's what people are buying. Yeah. I mean, when you think about this, like, you know, start thinking about like total addressable market. Let's put our investor hat on. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you think that we're selling personalized music, mm -hmm. you are going to have trouble figuring out how many people want to buy a personalized song. Is this super music nerds, the same ones who buy like vinyl box sets? Mm -hmm. Like how big is this audience? You know, how... And then you start asking yourself questions like, cool, when are you going to get bigger artists? When are you going to get artists that people know? And like, then people come here to buy from those artists. And like, you really start like messing with the, your, your perspective on how big the space can be. And like, I went through this, like, it's completely understandable because I lived it for years. It was our business and we thought that's what it was. Right. But then like when you can unplug and you start looking at like, no, it's experience seekers. It's the happy tears. It's the heightened emotion. That's what you're selling. Mm -hmm. Then it's like how many people want to make their mom cry happy tears? Mm -hmm. How many people want to make somebody that they love, like feel like the most special person on earth? Like Who then doesn't? you start like, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> infinite. <doesn't? laughs> it's, it's anybody with a soul. Yeah. And like, it's a big perspective switch in like how big the space is and how big the market is. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, I love that everybody doesn't really get it to be completely honest. It's like, uh, from a competitive landscape, like, you know, people don't get it. I mean, we have, we've had conversations with every single major label, every major publisher, and like, they're asking us questions like, how do we, uh, monetize the streaming royalties? of the songs. Oh God, PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it's that. just like, so. Yeah. Well, so, so let's talk about, uh, about the scaling phase then, right? So you have this kind of real scrappy early stage trying to figure out your identity and what you were really selling. You hit that inflection point. And obviously there was that moment of explosive growth where you had to shut off the, uh, shut off the ads. But yep. since then, how have you been scaling the business? Yeah, I mean, look, running running a startup, you're you're as a startup CEO, what I've always seen is if you choose to go the venture route, you're always telling two stories. 
Hmm. You're, you're, you're telling the story, the venture story, which is milestone based, based on particular KPIs and triggers for marketplace models. And on the other side, you're like actually building and trying to make the right decisions to get to the next step of your company's evolution. So it's always these two things. And those two things rarely like coincide with one another. One's usually going off left, one's going off right. So I think we knew as our our thought on how big this space was and how big this business could be um, clearly is, is, is really large. And to do that, we are going to need a significant amount of capital. So, you know, beginning to have those conversations and beginning to get a lot of feedback around Mm-hmm. This idea of how big is the TAM, how small is the market, and me trying to convince people, it kind of made me take this path to say, instead of building product correctly, and instead of building the proper technical infrastructure to scale this thing correctly, I'm going to leverage human beings, and I'm probably going to overhire for some of these roles because I don't have enough time to build the tech Mm -hmm. to basically prove out the scale. So like last year when we did five and a half million, I felt like the 5 million mark was the mark where um, if I could go from one to five in a 12 month time, I figured that's the mark in which I stopped getting beat up over the TAM. So it was kind of just like a race there from a scale standpoint without building the appropriate product. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so, you know, like that, that was challenging in itself because it was like, Hey, if we were trying to build this to scale, I'd be doing X, Y, and Z first. Right. Um, but it was kind of like, no, we need to prove this out so we can raise capital. Um, and then that, that, that proved to be correct. I mean, we raised, um, we raised a few million dollars on some notes from some big industry people that we have relationships with the weekend doja cat quincy jones like a bunch of like real real players yeah. kind of backed and uh kind of aligned on, on on what it was that we were doing so that was like stage one and then we got our first venture partner in uh sam yakin and corazon capital um at the beginning of this year, it was like January, February, where we like rolled up those notes and closed the $5 million seed round. And then very quickly after that, we did this larger A round um, in July. So, you know, the, the scale component was really focusing on the fundraising piece. Mm-hmm. And now that we're here and now that we have runway and and, and capital now it's about product and technology now it's about all these things that we've been doing with music supervisors on the team with human beings reading a brief and picking the right artist now we're starting to do like ai build recommendation engines and Mm -hmm. now we're starting to focus on how do we continue operating at this ridiculous level of scale Mm -hmm. but not keep trying to solve everything with with human beings it's probably that you know it's an age-old but probably one of the most common questions that i get at that stage at that inflection point is what am i building for right how much architecture how much scale am i building to the system into the system at this point and there there really is no perfect answer um but it's one of these i mean really it's the it's the co-founders it's the ceo and the cto that are like, give me the product, give me the money, give me the product, give me the money. And, uh, you know, it, it, I always, I always qualify the hell out of it essentially, but you know, you want to, you want to be able to say at least two X or three X, the amount of, you know, kind of load you have on the system. Um, but assume that you're probably going to rip everything apart and rebuild it maybe a year, a couple of years down the road anyway. Uh, you know, so don't over-engineer things, but it sounds like you you really honed in and focused on hey let's validate this thing let's make sure it really works and really has legs then go raise some capital and then and then build out the scale trade off being that all right you might get caught kind of flat footed when things really blow up um 
but maybe that's a little bit better of a problem than burning that early cash, huh? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we've pressure tested it pretty well with twenty seven thousand percent three. Years. <laughs> so, I, yeah. I I I think we've officially like ran through the stage of really blowing up and it actually mm -hmm. like doing what um, we always thought that it could do. Now, yeah, I I mean. Even if, even if we didn't have the pressure of raising capital, I think I probably, looking back, I'm very happy. To, I'm very happy that we took that path. I mean, I'm not hating that that I'm here and the revenue is here to support us to now build really intelligent product. You know, like yeah. I've seen the opposite way too many times. I've seen people have unbelievably like amazing systems and the product is. Mm -hmm. awesome and they can't turn a dollar mm -hmm. so yeah i definitely uh I, f I feel good about where we're currently sitting so what so what does the future look like for you you got a you, you just raised a big round things are heading off to the stratosphere what does scaling up look like for you over the next year or two yeah so i dropped a couple hints on that i'm not mm -hmm. i'm not gonna i'm not <laughs> i'm not gonna give the whole roadmap i mean but yeah. for us it's again it's it's about um, it's about creating connection. Mm -hmm. It's about blurring this line between who's the creator. It's about uh, taking previously passive consumers and getting them to be active participants. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, um, building this middle class of musician. Mm -hmm. It's about creating products and offerings that continue to fuel um, the, the, the little guy. Mm -hmm. to 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 become a a force within this business that has wrecked so many you know and i think like we're you know we're 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 definitely getting to a position in which we're going to be able to use the power that we're building in the right way mm -hmm. and i think that's what's really exciting for us i think if you talk to any of the artists that have been working with us for an extended period of time on the platform, they'll tell you the same thing. Like, I love this concept and idea of a future in which we've built such a strong base with this occasion-based product mm -hmm. that we can now cherry pick individual music industry problems mm -hmm. and build solutions for those problems in a silo and those solutions would not have to be the same solutions that you would want to suggest if you were trying to solve that problem as a business by itself. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just like there's so many problems in the music industry. And I understand like when a new publishing company is coming out, I understand how they're operating within this framework that isn't the most favorable to an artist because I understand how the X's and O's and the dollars and the cents work in that business model. Mm -hmm. But could we solve could we solve and create a new publishing entity that doesn't need to support the business, but the goal of the publishing entity is to continue to like build from the bottom up in the music in the artist community. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like what rules would we put in place then? We wouldn't have to take do 80-20 deals or 50 50 deals like we could do things that probably wouldn't make sense if the publishing entity was supposed to be the capital generating like business infrastructure yeah but if it's just a cherry on top of this business that just continues to grow and blossom mm -hmm. like maybe we could do some things different and i think that's when you're able to like you know, cons begin consolidating some businesses and some some verticals within music that have been fragmented forever. I think it's when you, you know, you can you can really build some solutions that have never been brought to the table before. Yeah. And that's what I'm excited about. That's what our future looks like. And I, I I think we're really lucky that not only everybody that works for this team believes in that concept and idea, but also like the venture partners and the people that are on board with this like believe in the, the the future good of what it is that we're trying to build it's not just about like only maximizing return it's about like living this mission that i'm talking about yeah when you're talking about conscious capitalism 
So that's something I'm a big fan of and, and, you know, I've been studying and, and, and coaching a lot as well is, you know, the old model or the, the model of capitalism we have here in this country and most of the Western world is around maximizing shareholder returns at the expense of all else. Um, in fact, it's, it's pretty much the law in, in, in most cases, right? You can get sued for not doing that if you have, you know, a certain type of investment. Whereas conscious capitalism is about balancing the returns to all stakeholders, meaning the customers, the artists, the environment, the employees, right? Everybody gets a, a you know, maybe not an equal share, but that there's balance there. And the benefit of that is everybody is happy, everybody's engaged, and that creates a thriving ecosystem, right? As opposed to grinding the workers and extracting money from the customers and destroying the environment and to give everything to, to the shareholders, um, which creates a lot of misery. Um, you're creating something that creates a lot of happiness, okay? So you're gonna have more engaged and better retained customers happier artists, everybody wins. And that's going to create that rising tide, which also benefits shareholders as well. Yep. So good on no, you. you get it, for sure. I get it, <laughs> I get it, I love it. So, well, wonderful. Um, no, this has really been amazing talking with you. I, I you know, you definitely have my full support. Uh, I'm definitely gonna be a customer here. I'm gonna be thinking about the occasions that I can, uh, that I can, I can use this for. And, um, you know, anything I can do to help you and, and to, get the word out there and to support you and your mission. I'm happy to do. Appreciate that. Yeah. Wow. Any, any final thoughts or words or messages you want to get out to the audience? Final thoughts. Um, no, I, I feel, I feel like I've, I've talked quite a bit. Yeah. I feel like I've uh, dropped my gems. I don't know. I, I, I think, uh, what about the uh, the the budding artists out there? The budding artists, yeah. I mean, so closing statement um, to to just independent artists. I mean, again, I I spent over. I've been in the music industry for two decades, and I definitely uh, have have uh, gotten gotten uh, kind of put through the ringer for at least half of that half of that time. And then probably the last decade began to uh, kind of figure out how to fight back. And I think, you know, I think as an up and coming artist, it's about um, just figuring out how to take this thing that, that you're so incredibly passionate about and find the right opportunities that, that, continue to fuel that passion. And I think if you can follow that, I think um, there's a bunch of growing scenarios in which that passion can ultimately be turned into dollars. So then you can continue to, uh, to pursue what it is that you're trying to do within the music space. Nice. I don't know. Hopefully Song Just, Finch is going to continue to create more of those opportunities in different for ways. For sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you being on the show today. Appreciate it, Eric. Thank you.